Ooh, good. Yo, Kaso. I know we should do this like they do in the Occupy movement. Mic check. Mic check. Ah, you've got to learn this. Mic check. Everybody say mic check. Mic check. Mic check. Mic check. Yo, Kaso. Yo, Kaso. Very good. That means welcome. Indeed, I'd like to welcome you all again to this splendid city of Yokohama. And indeed, I feel I'm, I've been, I'm parachuted into an amazing youth culture. This apparently is the romantic spot in Japan. This is the place where you make proposals. Apparently, the best proposals are made in the landmark building, that huge building. So if you have any uh, romantic ideas, that's where you should go. From its creation as a port in 1859, Yokohama has been host to many foreign visitors. As President Tarigoa of the Japanese Sociolo Sociological Society tells us, in his welcoming remarks, Yokohama is Japan's most cosmopolitan city, where over the last century and a half, different nationalities have settled. Chinese, Europeans, Koreans, Brazilians, Filipinos, and Vietnamese. According to the Japan Times, Yokohama housed the first Japanese ice cream parlor in 1865. It opened the first beer brewery in 1869, and that beer brewery is around the corner, available, uh, and gives us a sense of the 19th century Yokohama, in case you get tired of sociology. And the first soap factory also was built here in Yokohama in 1884. Who knows what exotic, or should I say dangerous, artifacts we sociologists are bringing today. Yokohama is no stranger to disasters. 6,000 sociologists. <laughs> Much of the city was destroyed on September the 1st, 1923, by the Great Kanto earthquake, which left over 30,000 dead and another 48,000 injured. Yokohama was rebuilt only to be destroyed again by U.S. air raids during World War II. Yokohama stands in for Japan, accustomed to the rebuilding now taking place after the earthquake and tsunami of March 11, 2011, and the nuclear meltdown that followed. It is important for us, and we've already heard quite a bit about it, but it is important for us to be here and bear witness to the courage and determination with which reconstruction is being undertaken. But who are we? We are sociologists assembled here to discuss and debate inequality. But inequality begins at home. Yes, we are over 6,000 strong. And yes, we do come from 120 different countries. We are growing in strength. And let me give you a few facts and figures about the ISA. Here is a figure of the increasing membership um, of the ISA, that pink line, and also the somewhat more erratic but nevertheless increasing participation in our congresses and fora. If we follow, however, the World Bank classification of A, B, and C countries according to per capita gross national income, with C countries being the poorest, then we find that there are representatives from 43A countries, 34B countries, and 43C countries. But digging deeper, we discover that 71% of the participants are from A countries, 19% from B countries, and 10% from C countries. This reflects the uneven development of sociology across the planet, but also the material inequalities between countries 
and also within countries that make it difficult for people to come here. If we look at the membership of our association, we find 65% are from A countries, 22 from B countries, and 13% are from C countries. Again, a very unequal distribution, despite the lower fees for B and C countries. Yet looking at membership figures over time, we see a continuous drop in the proportion of members from A countries, a drop from 74% to 66% today. You can see the figures there from 2002 to 2014. We are becoming, as people have noted already today, more inclusive. The same progress can be found in national association members, nor where we see an increase in the number of national associations that are members of the ISA, starting in 1950 with six, and today we have actually, I heard, 63. And you see that the increase is in all categories A, B, and C. Nor should we forget that when the ISA was formed in 1949, it was almost entirely dominated by North America and Europe with token representation from the Soviet bloc. We have certainly come a long way but we still have a long way to go. Over the years, the ISA has made strenuous efforts to become more inclusive. One of the problems we face, however, is the cost of attending a Congress like this, which is beyond the means of so many. Over half our members could not afford to come. With this in mind, the ISA has developed a series of digital worlds that make it possible for sociologists to learn about each other without moving from their computer screens. We have blogs such as the one on universities in crisis. We have global seminars featuring discussions of students with distinguished sociologists from around the world. We have interviews with former presidents of the ISA and the members of the executive committee so that you can learn more about the leaders of your association. And following the forum in Buenos Aires, we now have a platform for materials on social justice and democratization. And we have a website for posting the abstracts, and this is very new but very important, of PhD dissertations, which has been very popular among young sociologists. And, yes, we have something called Sociotube, where you can find all sorts of salacious sociology. But my pride and joy has been the ISA newsletter and magazine, Global Dialogue, that appears in four four times a year in 14 languages, bringing different perspectives on national sociologies, exciting new research, debates on controversial matters, and much more. Contributions from sociologists, young and old, famous and infamous, from all corners of the planet. One of the delights of editing Global Dialogue has been working with enthusiastic teams of translators, mainly young sociologists from Russia, Iran, Colombia, Tunisia, Lebanon, Taiwan, Romania, Poland, India, Turkey, Brazil, and, of course, Japan. We are cultivating the next generation of sociologists, truly global in practice and in imagination, excited to learn about sociology in different countries. All these digital worlds are open access, and it is our small attempt to both understand but also to counter this very unequal world that invades our own association. We are not an island, however. As sociologists, we know that our internal inequalities are in large part governed by external global inequalities. We are assembled here to face the unequal world, trying to meet the challenges it poses. And in the next 35 minutes, I will outline my approach to this challenge. It will involve spelling out three Ps. During these four years that I have had the honor and privilege to serve as your president, the theme of inequality has achieved unexpected prominence in public debate, and often from the most unexpected quarters. And for my first P, the new Pope, elected in March 2013, Pope Francis, the first Jesuit Pope, 
the first pope from Argentina, indeed the first pope from the global south, has been at the forefront of condemning inequality. There he is. He is my first P. Within six months of his election, he delivered his first apostolic exhortation that contained six theses on inequality. And I'm going to present them to you today using his own language. Number one, no to an economy of exclusion. He writes, just as the commandment thou shalt not kill sets a clear limit in order to safeguard the value of human life, today we also have to say thou shalt not to an economy of exclusion and inequality. Such an economy kills. How can it be that it is not a news item when an elderly homeless person dies of exposure, but it is news when the stock market loses two points? This is a case of exclusion. Can we continue to stand by when food is thrown away while people are starving? This is a case of inequality. Today, everything comes under the laws of competition and the survival of the fittest, where the powerful feed upon the powerless. As a consequence, masses of people find themselves excluded and marginalized, without work, without possibilities, without any means of escape. The excluded are not the exploited, but the outcast, the leftovers. And this is the Pope. So, thesis number two. No to trickle-down economics, he writes. Some people continue to defend trickle-down theories, which assume that economic growth encouraged by a free market will inevitably succeed in bringing about greater justice and inclusiveness in the world. This opinion, which has never been confirmed by the facts, expresses a crude and naive trust in the goodness of those wielding economic power and in the sacralized workings of the prevailing economic system. And this is the Pope. Thesis number three. No to the new idolatry of money, he writes. One cause of this situation is found in our relationship with money, since we calmly accept its dominion over ourselves and our societies. We have created new idols. The worship of the ancient golden calf, and here he refers to Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 to 35. The worship of the ancient golden calf has returned in a new and ruthless guise in the idolatry of money and the dictatorship of an impersonal economy lacking a truly human purpose. And this is the Pope. Thesis number four. No to the tyranny of profit. While the earnings of a minority are growing exponentially, so too is the gap separating the majority from the prosperity enjoyed by those happy few. A new tyranny is thus born, invisible and often virtual, which unilaterally and relentlessly imposes its own laws and rules. In this system, which tends to devour everything, which stands in the way of increased profits, whatever is fragile, like the environment, is defenseless before the interests of a deified market, which becomes the only rule. And now, thesis number five. No to the inequality which spawns violence. Today, in many places, we hear a call for greater security. But until exclusion and inequality in society and between peoples are reversed, it will be impossible to eliminate violence when a society, whether local, national, or global, is willing to leave a part of itself on the fringes. No political programs or resources spent on law enforcement or surveillance systems can indefinitely guarantee tranquility. This is not the case simply because inequality provokes a violent reaction from those excluded from the system, but because the socioeconomic system is unjust at its root. And this is the Pope. And for his last thesis, no to a financial system that rules rather than serves. I encourage, he says, he writes, financial experts and political leaders to ponder the words 
of one of the sages of antiquity. Not to share one's wealth with the poor is to steal from them and to take away their livelihood. It is not our own goods which we hold, but theirs, end of quote. A financial reform, he continues, open to such ethical considerations would require a vigorous change of approach on the part of political leaders. Money must serve, not rule. These are the six theses you will find in the apostolic exhortation. I have taken them out of a much longer text. But this is a radical program befitting of Marx's early writings. Inspired, no doubt, by liberation theology. But it lacks, it lacks empirical and analytical precision. For that, we need to turn to another unlikely inspiration for the study of inequality. Conventional economists have not worried about inequality, it being the result of marginal productivity or human capital, the just and inevitable outcome of economic growth. But today, we have a new breed of renegade economists, including Nobel Prize winners, Paul Krugman, Joseph Stiglitz, and Amartya Sen who have shown how untamed markets are to blame for the continuing escalation of the gap between rich and poor. But in recent months, a young French economist has taken the intellectual world by storm. He is my second P. His name is Thomas Piketty, a handsome young man born in 1971 perhaps part of the millennials. He has stolen the limelights from these older men with his blockbuster book, Capital for the 21st Century. Yeah. It is curious how such a thick, 600 page long, and somewhat tedious book should have so captured the imagination, not just of the academic world, but of the world of business and politics. What Piketty offers is an extraordinary detailed set of original data, much of it drawn from taxation sources that documents two and a half centuries of inequality, both in terms of income and wealth, for a variety of countries, not just the US and Europe, but also several larger developing countries, including India, South Africa, Brazil, South Korea, as well as OECD countries. What the data show is that the short 20th century between 1910 and the middle 1970s is an aberration of declining inequality brought about by wars and economic crisis, and that today, today, inequality has resumed its upward 19th century trajectory, showing no sign of reversing itself. He calls this new form of capitalism patrimonial capitalism, as it depends upon the inheritance of privilege and wealth. These claims violate the foundational assumptions of neoclassical economics. And let me give you a few graphs to give you a sense, for those who have not read the book yet, um, I give you a sense of uh, what he's up to. Now, this is a, I hope you can see it all, yes. Um, this is a graph, uh, perhaps the most famous graph actually in the United States. Uh, uh, it is a graph of the top. 10% uh, income, uh, to what extent it, it's actually the share of the top 10% in national income. And what you see is that starting in 1910, there's a slow uh, increase in equality, then it dips and dips and dips, and, and, then, and it is in 1980 that again it ascends. So you have this wave form of inequality. Another figure which he doesn't make much of is the one that includes Japan. And interestingly, Japan shows a slightly different uh, trajectory. Here we're talking about the top 1%. And the United States, yes, we see that upward trajectory after 1973. But Japan sort of is at a more even keel. I, pre I present this not just to, uh, because I am here in Japan, but because 
actually there is not necessarily a convergence on the US model. And sometimes he think we, when you read Piketty, you think that basically he is showing there is a singular pattern. So for example, a singular pattern that emerges out of the capital income ratio um, in Europe from 1870 to 2010. Again, what you see is this dip starting in 1910, um, which bespeaks increasing equality, which then uh, actually after 19, 1950 already begins to increase. Here we're talking about um, the, the market value of private capital um, divided by the national income. But anyway, the point is the same, that after this period, 1910 to 1950, 60, 70, there is this, this upward shift. And what he does is actually propose a future that looks like this. This is the distribution of world capital from 1870 to 2100. And as you see, Asia, uh, he says at the bottom here, according to the central scenario, Asian countries should own about half of the world capital by the end of the 21st century. Uh -huh. So he's making predictions of the future. This is his patrimonial capitalism. Yes. We will return, I will return to these graphs. What are my third P, which I'll keep a secret for now? Inequality used to be the prerogative of sociology, but the Catholic Church and the new economists have stolen our thunder. They have seemingly upstaged us on our own terrain. That They have no real answers to the problems they pose. The Pope calls for a new ethics, love and empathy, yet at the same time has been reluctant to do much about the existence and cover-up of sexual abuse, or the church's conservative positions on questions of gay sexuality, contraception, abortion, and other matters. Radical on economic matters, but conservative on social matters. His appeals must fall on deaf ears. Piketty, on the other hand, offers solutions that revolve around taxing the rich and the super-rich. But from where will the will for such taxation come? He has no theory of politics, no theory of the state, no theory of social movements, no theory of culture, and when push comes to shove, no theory of capitalism. He has a formula for inequality, but the factors behind the variables, namely rates of return on capital and economic growth, are left unexplained or subject to speculation. So he veers between a radical indeterminism, anything is possible, and a radical empiricism in which the world would just continue as is. As sociologists, we can do better. But we have to exploit the moral passion of the Pope and the empirical passion of Piketty to advance a genuine analysis of inequality. We must take back what is ours. But for that, we need another P. But for that, I'll have to keep you in suspense. <laughs> we are sociologists. We do not begin with moral exhortation or deus ex machina politics. They'll come in useful later. But with the real movement of real people in real relations as they live their real lives, from where does the Pope, after all, get his theses on inequality, if not from the movements of the Argentinian people? And where does Piketty begin his book? If not, with the striking Marikana mine workers of South Africa, but quickly loses sight of them in the thickets of economic data. The Pope and Piketty are religious and intellectual reflexes or refractions of the social movements that have powered the ascendant public concern of the last five or six years, the public concern with inequality. So let's begin with social movements. And I note there are many wonderful panels in the next few days on social movements. And there was already today a special conference on social movements. As your president, I have had the privilege to be invited to many places over the last four years. And I've made some 58 trips to 44 countries. And I want to take this opportunity to thank all of those who have invited and hosted me wherever I went, where, so hosted me, wherever I went, I looked for social movements that have sprung up as if from nowhere to challenge the inequalities they faced. 
And I'm here then to report to you my findings. I will first give you a chronology of those movements, then attempt to understand the repertoires they share before seeking to examine their broader significance. Okay, now I should stop reading. I should move more quickly. I'm going to give you four years, sort of four-year diary, quick diary of the social movements, of which most of them will be familiar to you. Okay. I want to start with the Arab uprisings. Arab uprisings, December 17, 2010, Mohammed Bouazizi sets himself on fire, not the only Tunisian to do so, but he uniquely sets in motion a social movement of national character, beginning in the hinterland where he lives, in Sidi Bouzid, where migrant workers are taking over the local jobs of miners, where agribusiness is displacing peasantry, and where graduates are unemployed. His self-immolation crystallizes a movement that spreads across the country to Tunis, where it is joined by the middle classes who are ever more pushed out of the increased consumption that they had privileged access to. And Ben Ali, the dictator beloved of the West because he kept Islam under control and because he brought IMF models to Tunisia, in three weeks, he's gone. Nobody could anticipate this. This surprised the world. And it triggered social movements in the Arab world. As we all know, next to fall was Mubarak in Egypt, the January 25th revolution that led to Mubarak's exit three weeks four weeks later. Massive movement has assembled in Tahrir Square. Again, had preconditions in the sorts of economic policies that had disenfranchised and dispossessed so many Egyptians. And then we know the social movements in Libya, in Syria, in Yemen, in Bahrain. These are the Arab uprisings. I mean, today we're less optimistic about those uprisings. And I've been back and forward in Egypt seeing how the optimism of the early days, the introduction of democracy, the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood, the way in which the military seized power, and now is a semi-popular government, if not amongst the Muslim Brotherhood, among many others, as a lesser evil. So they're back to where they begin, but they're not entirely back to their begin, because my point is going to be that what does change is people's consciousness of the possibility of social change. The Arab uprisings, let me move on to the environment. Moving into 2011, March 11th, 2011, we all now know what happened then. The earthquake followed by the tsunami, and then the nuclear meltdown in Fukushima. Um, this generated what had been a relatively dormant anti-nuclear movement in Japan, became a very significant movement in Japan. It has not had great success. Today we hear about the possibilities of nuclear reactors being put, put back into service. But it has generated a deeper consciousness about the dangers of nuclear power, so much so that in Germany, in reaction to what happened in Japan, the social movements there were incredibly powerful, so much so that Merkel was forced to reverse, was forced to reverse her policies. Koichi Hasegawa has written a very nice paper comparing actually the social movements in Japan, how they were weaker, the anti-nuclear movements, than they were in Germany. But we can talk about many movements concerned with the degradation of the environment. We can think of the movements in India that 
of peasants defending, the special, defending their land against encroaching special economic zones that have paralyzed many special economic zones. We can think of the more fragmented movements in, in, in China, the land grabs that, and the urbanization of the rural areas, land speculation. We can see how the movements there, though they have not had immediate impact, nevertheless, they exist. We see social movements all over Latin America around the investment, mining, international mining investment, displaced populations, polluted water. We can see Palestinians even protesting against the grabbing of their land through the expansion of Israeli settlements. There are many places in the world, even in the United States and Canada, you have now environmental movements around fracking. And of course, there is also the movement around climate change. So, environmental movements. And then we have the indignados, M15, May 15th. This is, celebrates the movements in Spain, the movements that are a response to austerity policies of the European Bank, the European Union, the European Commission. The movements that actually were largely populated by a younger generation that often educated, often with jobs that are insecure or without jobs at all, fighting the austerity problem, projects and occupying squares and using all sorts of newfangled techniques of self-organization. And we see similar things going on in Portugal, in Greece, actually much more militant in Greece, general strikes in Greece. The relationship between old movements, labor movements, and the new indignados is variable. We also have such movements in Italy. So that's the indignados. And then we can talk about August 2011. Here I would point to the enormous struggles by the student movement in Chile, the epicenter of the student, international student movement. You know, it began in 2006 with the penguins, the high school students who struggled, then went to university and then campaigned against privatization. Higher education is privatized to a greater extent in Chile than in anywhere else in Latin America. What was fascinating about that movement is how it actually embraced and brought in all sorts of non-student movements and non-student supporters and became a major factor in electoral politics as well as extra-parliamentary politics in Chile. There are student movements across the world, famously in Quebec, in Montreal, in England, usually against privatization of higher education and increasing fees that goes along with it. We can move on to the Occupy movement in October 2011, starting in Sukhothi Park in New York, against, yes, the 1%, the 1% that benefited from the crisis it generated. Well, that's how the participants in the Occupy movement saw it. So and that spread across the United States, indeed spread across the world. I went to many countries where the capital city was hosting some form of Occupy movement. And we can't forget the labor movement. And here I would like to draw attention to August 16, 2012. The striking miners at Lom Min Mine in South Africa, Platinum Mine, 34 of them were shot dead by the South African police, reminding people of the Sharpeville massacre under apartheid South Africa. And this, this massacre politicized the struggles in South Africa, and struggles spread to areas, labor struggles spread to areas where they had not appeared before. And we can see labor struggles inventing new techniques because labor's on the defensive, as I shall say in a few minutes. Labor's on the defensive. Indeed, labor today to be exploited, to have a secure job is a privilege of increasingly a minority. And what we should now be talking about is much more the ways in which labor defends itself beyond the workplace, in the public arena, using what Jennifer Chung calls symbolic politics, 
Or we could talk about Rina Agarwala's work on India and how amazingly some of the informal workers there have been, make, been able to make gains. So we can talk about the labor movement and its new strategies. And we should also talk about the movements in post-communist countries. A rather anomalous situation, because, of course, post-communist countries, members of those countries, they thought that the end of communism would bring the market and freedom. They discovered they were moving from one prison to another. Not all, of course, but many. And so the relationship of these movements to markets is a much more ambiguous one. But we have seen movements in, for example, starting November 2013, Ukraine, Kiev. This was a movement that was actually uh, against the government that had, uh, that had cut relate, was beginning to slowly cut relations with Europe. The protest, however, quickly turned into a protest against the alliance between different elites, economic and political elites, and then was overwhelmed by geopolitical issues. Yes. So, I've been pointing to you to the positive moments, to the positive movements, the movements for the expansion of freedom. But we have to recognize that that is not the whole story. That, in fact, there are dark clouds, and they have become ever more prominent over these four years. Dark clouds that indicate that movements of the left, of expansion of freedom, go along with movements of the right. We can think of Golden Dawn movement in Greece. We can think of even the ambiguities of the Grillo movement in Italy. We can think of Fides in Hungary. One can think of the elections and what they indicate in, the rec in Europe recently. One can think, actually, of the right-wing or the xenophobic movements here in Japan and the hate language that they have been using uh, that actually is another side to the portrait of social movements today that we cannot afford to ignore. All right, can we then say something about these movements. I'm going to give you six dimensions of their political repertoires. They are nationally specific movements. Nationally specific movements, yes. They are also globally connected. There's no doubt that they influence one another, particularly within regions, but even across regions. And they seem to understand their place as one that is not to engage the state, but actually to retreat from the state because the state is seen to be in a collaborative relationship to have been captured by the dominant classes, often finance capital. So, to use the expression of Zygmunt Bauman, there is a separation of power and politics. Power is concentrated, and politics, electoral politics, becomes impotent. And so they develop new alternative ideas of democracy, participatory democracy, direct democracy, prefigurative democracy. And Latin America, interestingly enough, is perhaps the most adventurous and interesting in experimentation in direct democracy. Perhaps because there was a coincidence of the movement from dictatorship democracy with structural adjustment programs that made the promises of democracy so futile. And then fifth, what is important about these movements, it seems to me, is that they not only work through virtual space, but they also are committed to a public space of face-to-face -face interaction, that the two work together. The one cannot work without the other. And finally, these movements have been put down with repression. But with repression, they also reappear. There's something, you know, Bauman, he writes a book on liquid modernity, liquid death. I don't think he's written liquid death yet. Liquid truth, liquid love, liquid 
Liquid Modern. What else has he got? Liquid, liquid. Don't you read Bauman here? Risk. Liquid Risk. Liquid Risk? That's right. Okay. But anyway, what he hasn't written yet is Liquid Protest. And this is, in a sense, what is happening. Much of these protest movements have a certain liquidity about them, flowing and fluidity. OK, these are my six features. I want to emphasize that they look really different in different places, the way they relate to one another. They have, again, as I insist, national configurations. But I think we can identify these as the features of many of these movements we have seen over the last four or five years. So, how should we deal with them? Now, I would love to give you a diatribe about social movement theory, but I won't. But let me say this about social movement theory. Conventional social movement theory. I'll mention no names. Social movement theory is concerned, particularly in its North American version, or perhaps I should say in its US version, uh, with universalistic theories of the very possibility of collective action. It's a puzzle for many people in the United States as to how social movements are possible at all. But we now know there are lots of social movements. The issue is not, the issue is not how is it possible, but what consequences social movements may have. Do they, in fact, and this is what we should pay attention to, transform the world beyond? And it doesn't mean institutionally, it can also mean just in terms of public consciousness. And also it can mean the transformation of the consciousness of participants. That is also extremely important. But also we must look at context. We must recognize the importance of context, nationally specific contexts, historical context and also global context. Indeed, that was the virtue, in my view, of new social movement theory associated with Alain Terren and his students. How they recognized that new social movements were reflective of what they called, what he called post-industrialism or the program society. That you have to understand social movements in their specific national historical context. But today we are not living in a world of the program society. We are living in a world of, well, they call it neoliberalism. And we have to, therefore, develop a theory of social movements that corresponds to that. And that is what I'm going to do in my remaining minutes, or try to. So, that's my third P. You didn't get it, Rudolf, you didn't get it. Oh, come on, how in from Vienna you couldn't? Karl Polanyi, the great transformation, the new canonical text for economic sociology, the great transformation written in 1944, was an effort by Polanyi to show how when you push markets too far, they destroy society, and society reacts, but it can react in a very reactionary manner. And he saw the rise of fascism and communist Stalinism as the result of pushing the market too far and society reacting in an authoritarian manner. Written in 1944, he was concerned with fascism. Yes, he recognized that social movements can actually take on a more progressive character and lead to social democracy. That can be also be a form of reaction. But he was particularly concerned with fascism and Stalinism. That they ultimately can be traced back to the rise of the market in the 19th century. And as we know, well, he said, humanity would never again dare to experiment with market fundamentalism. This would be crazy, self-destructive. He had faith in humanity. We know he was wrong. Starting in the 1970s, we have another wave. We have another wave of marketization. We have to, if we're going to take Polanyi seriously, we have to understand why he was wrong and why he could not anticipate that other wave. That is what I'm going to talk about now. 
So, from the Pope to Polanyi. Remember the Pope? Fifteen minutes ago, the Pope. Money, inequality, exclusion, profit, violence. I said he needed an analytical framework. Enter Karl Polanyi and his idea of fictitious commodity. A fictitious commodity, an idea that he did not really develop. It really is only in about 15 pages in the book of 280 pages. But it is a very interesting and important idea. The idea that certain factors of production were never intended to be commodified. That certain factors of production, land, labor, and money, when they are commodified, they actually lose their use value. Labor is not able to labor when it is subject to unregulated exchange. When nature is subject to commodification, it is no longer able to support humanity. And when money is commodified, when exchange rates are subject to the market, it so disorganizes the economy that businesses go out of business. Money was not intended to be the focus of speculation, but a medium of exchange. A medium of exchange to facilitate exchange, but not a source of profit. Hmm. So, I want to talk about Actually, these fictitious commodities, labor. Today, I think the movements around labor and the commodification of labor do not revolve around exploitation so much as around commodification, around insecurity, around what guy standing, and you can listen to him tomorrow morning, the first presidential plenary. He will be talking, I think, about precarity, precariousness, insecurity, how this is spreading, and how the real issue is for labor is commodification. And we see this in the labor movement that is increasingly finding obstacles to engaging in struggles at the point of production, using, as I said, symbolic modes of campaigning. But also we see Precarity at the center of the indignados, of the Occupy movement, and even at the center of the Arab uprisings. Insecurity, precarity is spreading around the world and moving up the socioeconomic hierarchy. And we might also include sort of a gender moment to this. That, a point made by Nancy Fraser, that in the commodification of the reproduction of labor power, that is the use ever more of paid workers who do the emotional labor normally done, have been done by women in the home, how this is now outsourced, how this now leads to what some have called a care gap. That in fact, commodification of the reproduction of labor power actually leads to, again, new forms of emotional insecurity. And it's not surprising there should be so much interest in studies of the relationship of work and family today in sociology. But let me move on to nature and the importance here of dispossession. Increasingly, we are living in a world where People linked to the land are being dispossessed of access to the land, whether it's in rural areas or urban areas. We are learning much more about the ways in which water is being privatized. See Bolivia, but also South Africa. And, of course, we have a situation with global warming where we're talking now about buying the right to pollute, carbon trading. Is, market, is the market a solution to the problem of climate change? That's nature. And then there's money. And money gives rise to debt. And there's so many of the lived experience of the financial crises of 2008 have to do, whether it's in the United States and Europe, have to do with the way that capital extends debt to individuals, to countries, to regions, and how that actually embroils people in a whole chain of indebtedness that they cannot sustain. 
Debt is a big dimension of inequality associated with the new instruments of finance. But there's a fourth fictitious commodity that Karl Polanyi did not think of that affects us immediately. And that is knowledge. That is knowledge. And with knowledge, what do we think of? We think of the ways in which the universities around the world, with few exceptions, are being increasingly privatized. And what does that mean? That universities, bereft of funds from the state, seek their own funds from corporations who then shape the sorts of research that can be conducted, at least in the long run, but also securing funding from students or increasing fees. Now, disciplines have to pay their way. And movements, the student movement, obviously is very centrally involved in what is the commodification of the production and dissemination of knowledge. We should also note there is another side of the story, of course, and that is the internet. The potentiality of the internet to actually provide publicly accessible knowledge, collectively, as knowledge used to be. You produce knowledge and it should be publicly accessible. But the internet will be the next terrain of struggle for privatization. And it is important to think about the relationship among all these four fictitious commodities if we are to understand the social movements of the last four years, I would argue. And we have to look at the way, for example, knowledge, the production of knowledge, actually intervenes in the ways in which labor is made precarious, in which money is, in which new financial instruments are introduced to increase debt, and how nature is increasingly subject to commodification. So that's my story about fictitious commodities. And what do I want? The conclusion of this part is that what is, what is crucial about a fictitious commodity? There are three possibilities. Is it that a fictitious commodity is something that arouses opposition because it is something that should never have been subject to exchange? Like my kidney, perhaps there can be movements, and indeed there are, about the ways in which certain things are commodified that seem to be abhorrent to the very idea of what those entities are, a sort of essentialist view. But there's also the idea that commodities generate commodification of the actual fictitious commodity, the actual production of the commodity involves disembedding, disembedding the entity from its community, disembedding land from the peasant community. And it is that process of disembedding that actually involves a lot of dispossession and violence, which generates many of these movements. And finally, one has to think about these fictitious commodities and the new forms of inequality that they generate, whether it be around precarity, whether it be around debt, whether it be around dispossession or privatization. But that's a rather contemporary vision. To understand these movements today, I believe, we have to also have to have a historical perspective and of course, I think Professor Wallerstein will approve of that approach. So, and actually, Professor Wallerstein's work is very influenced by Karl Polanyi. He may dispute that later, but I don't think he will. Where are you, Manuel? Hmm? Time. What, what, what do you want me to do? <laughs> Ten minutes? No, no, no. Hmm? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. <laughs> now, this is a very tough guy. No way 30 seconds. I got to... This is very tough. Let's see. Oh. Ah, uh, you've got to give me seven minutes. P presidential prerogative. Come on. <laughs> come on, come on. I... I'm a, a chair of local organizing committee. And I am the president. 
I have the microphone. OK. So, all right, I want to, I've got to speed up. OK. All right, I'll leave X commodification. Piketty to Polanyi. Well, look. Piketty, as you notice from those figures, there are waves of inequality. They are actually reminiscent of Polanyi's forward acceleration of marketization and response. No reference to Polanyi and Piketty. But we need Piketty and we need Polanyi. Now, what's the problem with Piketty? Is that he has an aggregate, for the most part, view of capital. He reduces it to market value. And so what he does is essentially he mystifies the distinctions between productive capital, finance capital, nature as capital, and knowledge. And these have to be disaggregated. And only when you disaggregate them can you begin to understand the lived experience of inequality. But Palani has a problem, as I said before. He only has one, in essential way, one swing of marketization beginning at the 18th century, end of the 18th century, and then the swing back after the period of depression. But actually, now we know there are two waves. If you really look at Polanyi seriously, you will find actually three waves, perhaps more. And that's my picture, my reconstruction. Oh, they're taking photographs now. There, this is my reconstruction of Polanyi with first, second, and third wave. Now, basically, this is a story for England about which I'll say something in one minute. But what I am suggesting here is that there is original, oh, there's no, oops. There's no thingy bob. Starting in the end, 1795, there is an upswing and then a counter movement. World War I, and then there's an upswing in marketization, then a counter movement. And then we have the oil crisis of 73. And we have, yes, we have Thatcher and Reagan exporting the ideas of marketization. We have the 89. Uh, and the uh, end of communism in Eastern Europe, we have the crisis, and, the, and marketization continues unabated. Will it stop? And what will stop it? What is that crisis? What is that question mark? It has to be the environmental catastrophe, in my view. And we should look at these ways in terms of the articulation of different fictitious commodities. OK, yes. So at, we should also look at the counter movement in the First wave of the 19th century, it's a locally based community struggles. That's where Marx's arguments would apply. But then we have in the 20th century, the nation state being the fulcrum of reaction and in the present period, a counter movement will have to take on a global character. But what will that global character be? That is not clear. Yes. And finally, we have to look at the global context of each of these waves. OK. What we do need, therefore, is not just to recognize there are waves, but we have to know why there are waves, what are impelling those waves. And to, that, to do that, we need to have a theory of capitalism that shows the conditions under which marketization is pushed forward. So. Since I have only a few minutes left, let me read. Give me five minutes, and I am going to read my conclusion. Yeah, all right, I'll make it one second. The challenges of global sociology. A global sociology has to transcend the nation, which has been the conventional unit of sociological analysis. It has to be more than an international comparative sociology, but one that seeks a realm of the global, yet without displacing the regional, the national, or the local. It has to be a sociology of the global. In this regard, I have taken Karl Polanyi's great transformation as a canonical text. It succeeds in moving through two centuries of history, at the same time linking the micro experiences of commodification to the national and global context that shaped them. However, from the standpoint of the present wave of marketization, it is a flawed account calling for reconstruction. First, re-examining history from the standpoint of the present leads one to replace Polanyi's singular wave with three waves. The first in the 19th, the second in the 20th, and the third, which is still incomplete, that stretches into the 21st century. 
Second, today, any counter movement against market fundamentalism has to assume global proportions, even if it is built on national and local terrains. The counter movement is by no means inevitable. And even if it were to take place, we have to recognize that it can assume a reactionary as well as a progressive form. Third, the destructiveness of the market can be understood through the lens of fictitious commodities, nature, labor, and money, to which must be added knowledge. These commodifications must be understood in their relation to one another and their combined effect on lived experience. Fourth, the production of these fictitious commodities requires what some have called disembedding, a benign phraseology that hides violent forms of dispossession and excommodification that I didn't have time to explain. Fifth, each fictitious commodity creates its own form of inequality based on precarity for labor, indebtedness for money, dispossession for nature and knowledge. Sixth, once we recognize a succession of ways of marketization and their real or potential counter movements, we must examine how their driving force arises from the dynamics of capitalism itself. And seventh, it is only in the light of all these considerations that we can ask whether and which social movements of today contribute intentionally or not to the advance of marketization or its reversal. The reconstructing the great transformation in this way, we must beware of the danger of false universalization of the standpoint of the observer. Notwithstanding his treatment of colonialism, Polanyi's standpoint was definitely from the West. And I have tried to indicate how the redeployment of fictitious commodities sheds light on social movements from all corners of the globe. Still, we must ask whether the succession of waves of marketization can be sustained for Latin America, Asia, and the Middle East. Can one, in short, develop a Polanyan perspective from the South, or is it irrevocably European? In short, a global sociology has not only to be a sociology of society, but also a sociology un in society, recognizing the place of the sociologist qua scientist within a planetary context. But sociologists have not only a place on the planet, but also in history. For example, their place in the succession of waves, which affects the assumptions they bring to sociology. So conventional social movement theory reflects a period of history, the 1960s and 1970s, of status regulation of markets. And therefore, today, we could carry a fundamentally different theory that I have proposed here. Sociologists are Janus-faced, simultaneously participants in society and observers of society. Neither face can be ignored. The assertion of such reflexivity is not to demonstrate the impossibility of science as it is for some, but to enhance its development to move towards a genuine rather than a false, uni false universalism, one that is built on multiple particularities. Coming to terms with being in the world is especially challenging at a time when the very production of knowledge is subject to forces of rationalization, and commodification that are also the object of sociological analysis. We can no longer pretend to be outside society when society is creeping inside us, invading our scholarly lives. We can be complicit in our commodification, selling our wares to the highest bidder, or we can join forces with public suffering a similar fate. Such engagement does not come at the expense of science, but is built upon science, giving it power and direction. There are, therefore, three challenges for global sociology. If the first challenge is to compose a sociology of society and the second is to build a sociology in society, the third challenge is to construct a sociology for society. That is defending the very object, civil society, that is sociology's own foundation. For sociology arose with civil society in the second half of the 19th century as a response to first wave marketization. Throughout its history, his sociology has taken the standpoint of civil society against market fundamentalism. This is as true of Marx, Weber, and Durkheim, as it is true of Parsons, Habermas, Bourdieu, Turenne, and Wallerstein, as it is of feminism, subaltern studies, and post-coloniality. By comparison, conventional economics and increasingly political science, notwithstanding dissidents, have provided the ideologies of third-wave marketization. Thus, if there were to be a singular social science, it would be dominated by economics and political science and sociology. Well, it would simply disappear. Therefore, sociology stands not with social science, but with scientific socialism. Which today means the defense of civil society against market tyrannies and state despotisms. We are not 
against markets, but against their overextension. We need to control them, as the Pope said, rather than being controlled by them. If both the head of the Catholic Church, and I'm, this is my last paragraph, if both the head of the Catholic Church and leading economists are becoming amateur sociologists, then we must show them the way. With our 55 research committees and our 63 national associations, we are uniquely positioned here in Yokohama to face the unequal world. First, to understand inequality and its multiple intersecting forms. Second, to recognize that we are a living part of those inequalities. And third, to realize that despite all our differences, our fate as sociologists is intimately tied up with the fate of humanity. So let me follow the Pope and give my last exhortation. Sociologists of the world unite. For we have only our parochialism to lose and a whole world to gain. The clock is ticking. We haven't got much time. So let the real business of this Congress begin. Arigato. Thank you.